favorite local musicians like you've never seen them before. Intimate collaborations between iconic artists and the musicians they want you to know about. Tonight, Soul Asylum featuring Loki's Folly. It's all happening right now live on the legendary 7th Street Entry stage. Beloved Minnesota rocker Soul Asylum returned to the entry for the first time in years. Please welcome to the stage, Soul Asylum.
course, is the infamous 7th Street entry. I don't want to talk about all the sex and drugs in the bathroom. And I used to go to a, a guitar store right across from my high school. As a matter of fact, some kid yelled out, I see you out there, Dave Perner. You're skipping class. And I was going to the guitar store, which was called, get this, Newt Cafe. Canute Cafe. It was one of those places where I'd walk in and be kind of mesmerized by all the guitars and, and just, it was still kind of bubbling up inside me that that's what I wanted to do. My favorite band at the time was the Suicide Commandos. And uh, still my favorite band. Anyways, Chris Osgood was teaching at the Newt Cafe when I found out that Chris was teaching lessons at New Cafe, I was like, sign me up, you know? And he was great, because I would say things like, oh, could you teach me how to do this? Because I think it will impress my friends. He goes, that's what it's all about, man, impressing your friends. And he just had this great attitude. At this time, Chris's band was called Speed Wiener. And he let me come down here when I was 16. So I had to stand in that back corner and I couldn't talk to anybody. And I just had to sort of pretend like I wasn't there. And uh, the opening act was uh, Husker Du. It was very exciting just to be in there. The entry was what it was all about. Kids off the streets gives them something to do, something to eat. This spot was a playground. This flat land used to be a town. Yeah. 
playing all these dumpy warehouse parties and house parties, really anywhere that would have us. You know, we don't care if we get paid, we don't, we'll play for beer, we'll do whatever. It's just all these little baby steps. Oh my goodness, they have a working toilet at this club and that's great. Oh, we made it all the way to Chicago without breaking down on the third try, you know. If you come in with expectations, you're not gonna make it. And we made some demos in our practice space and I went out to New York and I took them to seven or eight different record labels and Columbia was like, we want this band. And lo and behold, this thing that was on the outskirts started to be recognized by the labels and by the so-called industry. It was so instinctual to just weather the storm because it seemed to always be there. We used to make a joke about there was a black cloud following Soul Asylum around, and it did seem that way. It just seemed like everything was just kind of a disaster, and you just kind of expect that, you know? If everything breaks on stage, we'll sort it out when it breaks, but we should probably learn how to not have that happen. And that's a big part of what the punk thing is about to me, is that you're learning as you go along. You're not coming out of Juilliard and going, okay, I'm going to find other musicians of my ilk. You're hanging out with your friends and teaching each other how to move around on a guitar and learning from each other and really starting from nothing, which is kind of a beautiful thing to me, to just have that ambition without having any of the talent <laughs> to back it up and then just going, ah, I'll, I'll make do with what I got, you know.
in the key of D. For you bass players, that's this one. That's a joke, Oscar. <laughs> Are you ready with that tambourine? Ready? One, two, three, four. She walks into the outhouse, the cold night breeze into her face. Hi, I'm Annie. I'm Nissa. And I'm Oscar. And we're Loki's Folly. I really wanted to learn to play guitar, to be in a band, and uh, I was looking for a teacher. We went to Twin Town and we found Ryan there. I started as Loki's Follies bass, guitar, and drum teacher and became their producer and have been working with them ever since. She reaches through the darkness. Ryan told me about Loki's Folly and he said, oh, go check them out. They're down at the Ice House. And I was kind of blown away. I was like, these kids aren't messing around, you know? So I was kind of following them around a little bit, and then I was like, is this weird? She starts wondering what they mean to them. to be mean. Thinking about that scene, do they? Just to be seen. Try not to see it so. Just like anyone. Just like anyone. Like anyone. singing along on that one, Oscar? Which one? <laughs> the song we just played. Classic bass player. <laughs> what? Here's Annie, Nissa, and Oscar. Loki's fun. I mean, it just worked for me. It's like it's unique and it's powerful, and they're pissed off about something, and I like that. 
They don't seem that pissed off <laughs> regular life, but I don't know. Maybe you guys are like that all the time. <laughs> Ask your guitar teacher. Do they just come in like, wow, I'm yeah. going to be red. This is a fucking ride. Yeah, this is like, <laughs> <laughs> not very fun to yell I hate you at someone just in a conversation but doing it through a song is really fun. <laughs> I think most of our songs tend to um, whether they pull from stories or not tend to have some sort of personal connection or meaning and I think it's definitely our way of expressing our own emotions especially any emotions that are like hard to communicate and like trying to express my frustration as an autistic woman going through schooling and kind of really struggling with people in our situations not really acknowledging my need for help and kind of trying to, you know, appease the situation and tell me that, you know, the things I was experiencing weren't real or that I shouldn't be complaining about them. And I think having um, this path of being able to give myself a voice was really uh, helpful. This is a song Nissa and I wrote together in our basement, because we're all siblings, so we all live <laughs> in the same house. It kind of started off just being very, very silly, and kind of just, you know, what rhymes with peach. <laughs> but then I think we got a little serious in some of the verses, so, you know, we can't all have fun all the time. I'm sitting on my beach.
the way I remember it is Annie signed up for guitar. Yeah. And it wasn't too long after that Nissa wanted to play drums. Oscar, you joined <laughs> shortly thereafter. I remember you said you wanted to, when you were seven, you started pl- taking bass lessons and you said, I got, hey, I got to wait until I'm nine. <laughs> Not ready yet. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. I don't okay. know why it was nine. <laughs> you were just you were very adamant said, about it. That though. was when you were old enough. You guys probably always had the master plan of starting a band, but <laughs> it just kind of, in, in those lessons, we really started diving into observing bands that you like, taking notes. You guys would go to a concert. I remember we would do little essays on <laughs> on on what you learned from the shows. We were learning covers. As Ryan will know from the amount of covers he had to teach <laughs> us of this band, Green Day was our, one of our <laughs> first... <laughs> Um, but then we kind of developed other interests. We'd learn about a band figure, hear something like Green Day or something, and then we'd play it for our parents, and, like, our mom would be like, oh, with, like, Green Day, she was like, oh, you like this band, you should try the replacements, they're really cool, they're from here, and then it would just kind of, like, evolve from there. Like, a lot of the local music, like Soul Asylum and, you know, (laughs) replacements and... Could you and Babes in Toyland? We just were like, wow, this is so cool. They're from where we f- we're from, and like we could be just like them because we're in the same place they were playing the same type of stuff. I didn't fully grasp the concept that there were all these bands that were from here. It was I, that was a very exciting moment <laughs> when I realized that there were so many of the bands that we listen to are from where we live. <laughs> First of all, I was just excited they wanted to play music together because I've always found that making music is a communal thing and it's more fun to do with friends and family. If you can do that, that's amazing. I guess kind of along the way, I was always thinking, wow, this this is actually turning into something more than just a couple kids that want to play an instrument. This is actually, they're, they're creating their own world here and their own universe of music. I started kind of secretly, I would tell them, I would say, is it okay if I, you know, record this? And I was kind of secretly playing it for some outsiders that I thought could help the band out and could offer some feedback and advice and stuff. And everybody was unanimously saying, this is really cool. You know, there's a lot of support, I guess, for what they were doing. This last song is um, Appease the Girl. And on the record, we were lucky to have a very special guest on that, too, so he might be here tonight. <laughs> this song is um, Appease the Girl with a uh, special guest, Dave Burner.
and I've learned so much about music since I started. You start to see the similarities in all different kinds of music, which is a bit of a revelation, you know? All styles of music have more in common with each other than they, than they don't. I like the arts, man. I mean, I, you know, I think that you should have an art class and you should have a music class. Should you have to? Yeah, maybe not. If music class was like math class was to me, then I would say opt out, which I couldn't opt out of math, but I wasn't good at it. So I struggled and I learned to dislike it. And I think that if you're trying to force somebody to like music or art and they're just not having it, let them move on to math. But it should be encouraged as something that is important and something that you might fall into for the rest of your life. You'll get some more keys and more passes to understand how music works and what came before this and how this affects that and the instrumentation and all that sort of stuff is kind of universal. It's not rock and roll, it's not jazz, it's not this, that, and the other thing. It's just music. So all that perspective that is gained from just listening to people that know more about it than you, because, you know, there's a lot of punk rock people that when you're 18, you think you know absolutely everything. You need teachers and you need mentors and you need people to encourage you. And I was shown that from the Curtis A's and the Chris Osgoods and the suburbs, and they were always very encouraging to me. They were never like, ah, you're never going to make it, kid. They're like, this is for everyone. Everyone has a go. took her, I was a disgrace. I was out of line, I was out of place, out of time to save face. See the open mouth of my suitcase, saying, leave this place. Leave without a trace, leave without a trace. Job with honest pay. Might as well join the mob. Benefits are okay. Sitting in the sun with the popsicle. Everything is possible with a lot of love and a pretty face and some time to waste. To be without a tree. to dance at a funeral, New Orleans style. I joined the Great Dancers Union, I had to file. Tried to do the right thing, play it straight. The right thing changes from state to state. Don't forget to take your mace if you're out. Walking late, I'd like to see your face left without a trace.
when Runaway Train came out, we went out on tour, and I was like, let's not play it. And the band was like, whatever, Dave, whatever it is you're going through, it seems like a stupid idea, but okay. To me, it was, it was a way to propel forward and not rest on the laurels of the song everybody seems to know. But more often than not, I mean, we were playing in the entry, and this guy came back and he said, uh, me and my friend drove down from Alaska to hear Runaway Train and you didn't play it. You know, I felt bad. A lot of people say that to me. We, we, came, we drove four hours to come and you didn't even play our favorite song. And it started to kind of wear on me and then I started feeling like an <laughs> And then I'd end up explaining, you know, taking 10, 15 minutes to explain to somebody why I wasn't playing it. And then I realized that I could have played the song in the time that I'm explaining why I'm, I'm not playing it. So I was like, ah, ah, screw it, I'll just play it. And, and I enjoy playing it every time I play it now. It's fun and easy to play and I enjoy the reaction. You can tell in the audience that people get emotional. Like sometimes people will start crying. You know, you see a couple move a little closer together.
I know this song. This is one we were working on this in the they called the basement. I don't know if y'all have been in the basement, but it used to rival CBGB's dressing room back in the day, if you could call it a dressing room. Anyway, somebody called it a green room today, and I I got a little chuckle out of that. I guess, in a way, I'm living out what I thought was possible when I was 17. Maybe what you dream of when you're a kid isn't always impractical, and maybe if your parents tell you that that's not cool or your friends make fun of it or everybody just thinks there's no way, I mean, that was, that was me, and it's, it's cool. I mean, I, I certainly would be miserable in a lot of other jobs. I, I can pretty much guarantee you that. Was this soul folly? Loki's Asylum. They got a record called Sizu. Which means, correct me if I'm wrong, empowerment in the face of adversity. It means, it means have a good time all the time, no matter what. Yeah? Something like that. Walks into the outhouse, the cold night freezing to her. The cards are 
Funding for this program is supported in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, Janine and John Spear, and these stage supporters. <laughs>